It's something that few people consider, but even an activity as basic as walking requires an immense amount of coordination. In fact, walking seems routine because it's done automatically, but indeed it is a very complex task. To walk, to write, or to perform other even simpler movements, the brain must activate and deactivate the appropriate muscles in just the right sequence with just the right intensity. The brain is very much like a computer. It contains many, many chips or IC chips, that, as we call it in computer terms. Um, that stores up programs. When you are young, you start to learn many, many different actions. So once you've learned the motor program, you don't need to think about it to do the movements. Certain disorders interfere with the brain's programs and its ability to orchestrate that smooth muscle activity. There are many ways that that kind of movement control goes wrong. You can have a problem with the original plan. You can have a problem with the muscle and nerves themselves. You can have a problem with the, uh, the comparison mechanism. That's what's testing whether what you did is what you wanted it to do. And all of these things can result in abnormal movement. Known as movement disorders, these medical conditions can result in either a scarcity or paucity of movement, or they can lead to an excess of movement. The category of movement disorders in which there's a paucity of movement are mainly Parkinsonian conditions. Patients with Parkinson's have trouble starting a movement. They have trouble continuing, following through with the movement. Uh, it's, it's an effort to be, reach out and pick up a glass or walk across the room. On the other end of the spectrum are disorders like dystonia that are characterized by an excess of movement or involuntary movements. It's estimated that dystonia affects hundreds of thousands of people in North America alone, making it the third most prevalent movement disorder after Parkinson's and tremor. Dystonia does not discriminate. It affects men, women, and children of all ages and all ethnic and racial backgrounds. Dystonia is actually a blanket term that is used to describe abnormal contraction of muscles. And this abnormal contraction of muscles in any part of the body may produce some movements or some abnormal postures. It can affect the eyes, it can affect the neck, vocal cords, upper limbs, lower limbs, and the trunk. So essentially every single part of the body can be affected. Dystonia is not one thing, but it is a, it is a syndrome of multiple different disorders. When we speak of dystonia, we're thinking of something like fever. And there are multiple causes for fever, as we know. Just as that is the case, there are multiple causes for dystonia. We have primary dystonias, which are the genetic forms. Uh, then we have the secondary dystonias that are due to other known neurologic problems. Stroke, head injury, drug reaction, um, toxins, etc. So far, over 14 different types of dystonia have been identified. And although many of these have a genetic basis, the true cause of dystonia appears to be a complicated interaction between heredity and environment. As are almost all things that uh, are disorders of the brain or all things that are normal in, in the brain. It's a complex combination of uh, genetics and environment. While the cause of dystonia is not fully understood and the progression of the disease in individual patients is difficult to predict, one thing is clear. Dystonia is not fatal. What goes wrong seems to be that in trying to make movement, more muscles are brought into play than are needed for a particular movement. When there, something goes wrong with that program, it ends up sending forced information to the different muscles. Some muscles may get more information than they should and they start to contract. Some get less information than they should and they relax inappropriately. Usually the muscles that are contracting are the ones that work opposite of each other on a joint. So the muscles were called agonists and antagonists. The muscles are fighting themselves. Uh, that uh, the antagonist muscle is fighting the agonist muscle and uh, so it is very difficult for there to be a smooth contraction of some sort. Someone with dystonia, they attempt a movement but they may not be able to turn off the opposing muscle. So you end up with twisting or pulling or activation of many muscle groups. In addition to its obvious physical effect on the body, dystonia can have a serious emotional impact as well. This is a chronic illness and with chronic pain associated and with disability associated with it and you would expect that that group of people are more likely to become depressed. I came as close to having a nervous breakdown as you can come. Depressed, 
anxious, couldn't talk to anybody, wouldn't talk to anybody. And most people start withdrawing. I even found myself withdrawing. High degree of anxiety, some degree of depression. I think recognition of depression could be something we could easily accomplish in the next five years. It's not fancy, it doesn't involve biochemical assays, but I think trying to, to get doctors to understand and to look for depression in the patients that they see. When you meet somebody with dystonia, as a, as a neurologist, my job is to figure out what kind of dystonia that person has because it makes a tremendous difference in terms of treatment, prognosis, complicating factors. Okay, there you go. Oh, oh, oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. One of the most common forms of dystonia is early onset childhood dystonia. This is a form of generalized dystonia, meaning it affects muscles throughout the body, and it usually starts in childhood or adolescence. It started when I was um, 10, but then I was only correctly diagnosed when I was about 15. I was 14 when it started, and then when I was about 16, I was diagnosed. I was 32 when it started, so it was unusual that it would start at such a old age. But uh, so I got to get. I was lucky maybe to have those years, my younger years, without it. In children overall, it tends to begin in the foot, especially young children, and does tend to spread in most of those children to other body areas. More common in adults than generalized dystonia are the focal dystonias. With focal dystonia, the disorder remains localized in one specific muscle group or region. For instance, the vocal cords. Spasmodic dystonia is a condition which involves the vocal cords. Con control of the vocal cords is affected. I was almost unable to speak. The blocks, the spasms were so bad. I was croaking. I was strangling. I couldn't get my words out. Now the vocal cords normally relaxes when you breathe in and out, but when you want to speak, they tense up. There is a muscle doing that. It was deeply worse. The spell of pie was But the control of this mechanism is uh, at fault. So when a person tries to speak, the voice either gets too tight, that is the vocal cords come together spontaneously, or they leak air because the vocal cords are being pulled apart. This is what forms spasmodic dysphonia. Blepharospasm involves the facial muscles, particularly the ones around the eyelids. It gives rise to spontaneous closure of the eyelids. It can present initially as involuntary blinking, which looks like a habit, but it can range from this mild affection to a very, very severe state so that the eyes are persistently shut. And in fact, some patients can go and register themselves as legally blind. Well, I was diagnosed in uh, 1982 with torticollis, which is the neck problem. Torticollis is uh, dystonia of the neck. The official term for it now is uh, cervical or cervical dystonia. Um, it involves neck muscles. It causes the muscles on one side of my neck to go into almost like a charley horse. And when it's at its worst, it causes my head to turn like this. And I really have no control over it. It can be very, very sustained and associated with a lot of muscle pain as well.